the speaker is Chris Sorensen, uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, the next generation release. Um, also, uh, housekeeping, noon is lunch, so Chris is kind of in a tough spot between you guys and lunch, but lunch is second floor, uh, Regency Ballroom, so head back out that way, down one floor, and you should run right into it. Um, all right, so we'll get this thing going. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Chris. He's a longtime personal friend, uh, so I've been able to uh, follow up on uh, his progress. He and his team at University of Washington as they've uh, been developing Michelangelo, which he's going to speak about in a second. Uh, he is also, uh, for those of you who don't know, he is the uh, creator of this fine event. So um, any uh, questions, comments, feedbacks, he would love to hear from you guys because uh, you guys are what uh, makes and uh, drives this, um, this conference. So please welcome Chris Ordenson. Thank you, Davey. Can you guys hear me okay? Well, I guess we're, we're uh, almost to lunch, and that's an appropriate time to talk about allergies. And when Davey was so kind to give me the uh, generous uh, introduction that I created this event, it's been, it's been a whole village. But to allergies, I do have one, and it's to criticism. So if you guys could keep that to a minimum, I would appreciate that. But thank you for being here today. Thank you for attending our event. Uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to share with you some of the work that we've been doing at the University of Washington in developing this Michelangelo application, which we'll get to in a moment. And then also, on a very personal note, it's, uh, it's so awesome to see this place packed full of people that share a common uh, vision and a common ideal in terms of wanting to help wonderful organizations using information technology and data. And uh, to be richly rewarded with all of you guys interrupting your routines to come here. I know getting poked and prodded by TSA is not very high on people's uh, voluntary to-do list, uh, but I do really appreciate it. And so a very heartfelt thank you from, from me for, for being here. Uh, my presentation today is, is going to be a lot about the nuts and bolts of what it is that we've done in building this application. We're going to actually go inside. We're going to look at some of the new features that we are releasing out into the wild. We're going to talk about some videos that we've developed for training purposes so that we can relieve some of the pressure on your help desk. We're going to talk about a new website that's launching that contains a whole plethora of information of the technology. But I thought, and it, was a, it would be a good place to begin, is that this effort has not just been, uh, come on in. No, you're all right. Welcome. My assistant, everybody. <laughs> this technology has not just been about the University of Washington. And uh, when I was talking to my partner on this, Sean Drew, the other day, we felt that it was really important to highlight some of the other institutions that have helped make this uh, actual reality. And a lot of the work that you're going to see presented on the screen is a result of the trust and the investment and the participation of big institutions across the country. And if you'd let me for a moment, I'm just going to take a second to kind of talk about a couple of the individuals that have helped make this possible for us. Um, if we start down the coast, we've got the University of California system. And to date, two schools of the UC system are participants and have fully deployed our solution. The University of California Davis, John Finazzo, the team down there, great group there, as well as the University of California San Francisco. Uh, uh, Mita and Rachel, if you see them today, ask them about our solution. I'm sure they'll be happy to, to talk with you about that. Clint McNutt, are you in here? Clint right here, University of Oregon Foundation. It's about the only time you'll see a duck and a husky get along. Uh, <laughs> But Clint and his team are in the process of deploying this application. According to my team and, and Dinah, who's worked with Clint, they've got a really neat data model that's going to be released out uh, to the, their users shortly. University of Colorado, do we have any of the Buffaloes here? Is Dennis here or any of those teams? Well, University of Colorado is also one of our partner schools. And we just uh, recently got down there with them and are finishing up our data model with those guys. George Washington University unfortunately could not be here today. Bill Jacko and his team, if any of you guys have been following the weather on the East Coast, those guys unfortunately couldn't get out till Thursday, but uh, it would be great to have them. Uh, University of Missouri, do we have any of the Missouri team here? Richard, right there, University of Missouri. We were there a few weeks ago in Columbia. A beautiful place. I don't recommend going in the middle of February. It was a little chilly, but go in the summer. It's great. We're excited to have Mizzou on board with us. NC State, Similar deal with the weather. NC State's been on us and running for two years. Uh, the Wolfpack is coming back. We're just now in the process of talking about renewing their license. University of Texas at Austin. 
If you've ever had a chance to go to Austin, the best Tex-Mex in the world is there, as well as two of the finest people I know, Cesar de la Garza and Austin Bush, great people that have helped deploy our system to that uh, school there in Austin. And then, of course, here at the University of Washington, uh, where we've got this solution deployed across the board uh, to multiple different places. So we've built and are growing our family out, and it's great to see the response so far from some of these really wonderful, leading, cutting-edge research institutions around the country. When we think about data visualization and what we're trying to do from a self-service reporting format and putting on a conference like this, I think it's important to also be able to highlight and point out that we're not alone in this endeavor. And there's a couple of folks that have sponsored us or who are participating with this event that I encourage you to also check out what their solutions are as well. Everybody in this room has heard of Tableau, right? Okay, Tableau is here. I think tomorrow you guys are going to be really energized. Their chief marketing officer is going to be doing a general address. They've got a great solution, and they continue to invest heavily in that. Uh, it's really a nice complementary tool to what we're doing. Uh, advisor Solutions. Anybody here deploy Advisor? No? Nope. Advisor Solutions is also here. I encourage you to grab some of their information downstairs. And Prospect Visual. Do we have any of the team from Prospect Visual here? Prospect Visual is another uh, visual tool that I would encourage you guys to take a look at. And Maptivate. Did anyone use the map before the event to be able to connect with other people? Anybody? A couple of you? Yeah, so Maptivate is going to be here. Uh, there's a visualization session by the gentleman that created that a little bit later uh, this afternoon. So I mentioned that we're going to talk about some of the new things in our interface, uh, the training videos that we've released. Um, one other item that I want to make sure that you guys are aware of, we are going to end this session a little bit early to stage lunch. Uh, so like Davey said, I'm the only thing that's separating between you guys and lunch, and we'll make sure to get there. So just a handful of different things about some of the milestones that we've hit since we've uh, started this process about four years ago. In earnest, uh, we've only been deploying this from a licensed technology standpoint since April of 2012. So about 21 months uh, we've been going at this, with the University of California Davis being our, our, our first licensed deployment, quickly followed by NC State University. Since then, uh, I mentioned the schools that were in attendance, but we've grown to double digits in terms of the people that are adopting and using our technology. Why I think that's important to announce this in this room is that this isn't being done in a vacuum and that there's a lot of people contributing to the ideas and you guys are going to see some of that stuff come through. Our team is very serious. Vijay, Dinah, Sean, the rest of the group are very serious about incorporating that feedback to really make this the absolute best product that we possibly can because we understand what the impact is of us doing a good job. And so to the extent that we can do that and leverage those investments and those licensing fees is really important to us. So growth is definitely part of our horizon because it enables us to continue to hopefully develop a really wonderful tool for all your organizations. We are, just for a 101, 100% fully deployed in the Microsoft Azure cloud. Uh, Buck and his team are some of the connections that we met through Catherine and Alaska Airlines. We met Buck a few years ago and have worked with them. We are 100% deployed up in Azure. So what that means is what you're going to see here in a minute requires really no custom system designed or implemented on, at, at your shop. We have one small executable with a couple of uh, data security certificates that we install, but otherwise the end user experience 100% through the web. So we can scale up or down accordingly and not really be a burden in terms of uh, your internal IT and support people. Uh, uh, third, uh, we've been, uh, one thing that you'll notice about this when we throw it up here, uh, for those of you where uh, campus credentials federated authentication, single sign-on, where that's important. We've been able to leverage that successfully at all of the schools for which we've deployed this solution to. So if you're in the process of thinking we want a self-service reporting tool, we want to be able to leverage single sign-on, Michelangelo is an application where you're going to be able to do that with. And we do this through the InCommon Federation. And for those of you who aren't familiar with InCommon, afterwards, if you want to come talk to me about that a little bit more, uh, we can sh share with you kind of how we actually go about and, and through that process. Uh, fourth, and before we actually get to it, uh, is a, a new interface that we're going to show you guys today. We were very fortunate at UW to broker a, a really wonderful relationship with our visual communication design program. In fact, that daily drive that you guys got today, that paper copy of that, is a product from that group. And uh, some wonderful faculty over there who are teaching some really awesome kids how to be wonderful designers. The entire interface, as we're going to show you, was 100% student designed. 
which is pretty phenomenal for a solution like this. So it'll hopefully give you a sense of the talent also that's coming out of the University of Washington. And finally, six is to uh, show you it is uh, show you what it is that we've done. So I'm going to move this over. I apologize for the rendering on this, but it's the best that it's going to be today. So we're going to go ahead and, and get into it. So these are all schools that have either had a license with us or have asked for a trial version of the application. We're going to come down to the University of Washington. University of Southern California, is anyone in here from there? Susan, there we go. There we go. We got a couple. They are just about ready to go live with us, hopefully here within the next two or three weeks. It's great to have USC on board. I was looking through our, our, our roster earlier today, and uh, one, of the, one of the people from USC that I'd hoped to be here was Tracy Vranich, but uh, we, we had her yesterday. She's been a, a wonderful part of the, allowing us to get down there at SC as well. So when we log in here, Michelangelo, this is the University of Washington campus authentication. So we are leveraging right now the UW NetID technology. Now, when I authenticate into the system, one of the things that's unique about Michelangelo is we are on a system called Advanced. Everybody familiar with Advanced, the CRM, right? So we bring into Michelangelo all of the user rights and accounts from Advanced. And so we, with SC and some of the other places that are looking to do Salesforce, uh, as well as some of the other uh, one-off CRM solutions that are out there, we will also be integrating and try to pull that metadata from those tables so that when your users come in, you will be able to map out what data sets they have access to to be able to query, as well as what their permissions are as to what data they can export out of the system. So I come into Michelangelo. This is what I'm uh, first able to see. Administration is for those of you that will be administrating the application on site. And these blue boxes here are actually data sets. And so depending on how many data sets it is important to deploy on campus, uh, we can extend out to as many as you actually need. So we have some places that support an annual giving function through these data sets. Uh, for us at the University of Washington, we do things for our law school by incorporating data from the Bar Association as well as the advanced database. We do a data set for our alumni association, athletics uh, for the uh, football stadium that we just brought online, academic departments, arts and sciences and engineering. And today what we're going to do is we're going to go down to our main data set, which is uh, on the uh, advanced database. So the advancement database at the University of Washington has about 1 million and 30 5,000 entities in it. The largest one that we've deployed to date, Dinah, was it be Texas that we've got up, which is about one and a half. So about 1.5 million the University of Texas loads into this. And so what this is doing right now is it's taking relational data and throwing it up so that now we can actually query the system. So a little Michelangelo one-on-one -on -one for those of you who don't or haven't been presented with this before. The idea behind this is you start with a big block of data and you chisel it down until you get the list that you're most interested in. Hence the name Michelangelo. David started out with a block of granite, chiseled it down to get, get, the, uh, get the statue. And we do that similar with data. On the upper left-hand side is the usually, generally speaking, the most important number that people are concerned about. And so for us, that's 1,035,000 entities. And all of the interaction here on the right-hand side is going to reflect a change in that number as we distill down to the population that we're trying to extract out of the system. Here on the left is a series of different categories of information that are logically contained in groupings, different filters that are there. And so we have this, this bar filter, and if you want to interact with the bar filter, you simply, if you want to get rid of all branch corporations, you click on it, and you'll see the population drop accordingly. If you want branch corporations back in, click on that, and it's right there. I should note that everything in this application is sortable. It's sortable alpha and numeric, so alpha by the label of the field, numeric by the values that are presented in the bars, and then there's a third way to sort it based on your business rules or your own rendering of the data. We can customize the code behind to actually render it in a way that would make sense for you based on how your business rules are. One thing before we get too far down into it, Everything on this left-hand side, everything on the, on the middle here, all the numbers, the labels, calling it record type, everything is completely configurable within this application. 
nothing uh, comes standard out of the package that can't be changed by what it is that you would like to in terms of referring to the data for your institution. So in addition to uh, this, this, this bar chart, some of you may have already seen some of the uh, other uh, types of filters that we have here. Uh, for example, we have this really cool map feature that leverages Bing Maps where you can go down there and we can search by a custom area. So we can come here, once it switches over, start in Seattle, go up to Everett, over to the Cascades, come back, loop up, we can apply, and now we're gonna drop that population down to everybody who is in that area of uh, the Puget Sound. And once we've actually dropped that population down, if it's gonna participate, there we go, drop down 462,000, we can start to see then if we go back up to this bar, once you've made that change in the query, it jumps back up. For your end users, this is awesome, right? You don't have to know anything about joins. You don't need to know where the data is stored underneath. Makes it very slick, very easy. So if you wanted to take that little triangle shape that we did uh, and restrict it to just alumni, quickly we would just hit that none button up there. Everything would go away. We'd add alumni, and there you've got your alumni in the Puget Sound region that fast. If your users ever get caught and they need to restart the data set, just hit restart, all the numbers scroll back up. If you're looking to deploy from an ad hoc standpoint, this is great because all those idle curiosity report requests that come through, can you give me a count of this? Can I get a number of that? By being able to construct, and hats off to Dinah, this is our most complicated data model to date, put that in their hands to do rather than self-service, or rather than serving those reports out of your reporting environment, or reporting team. So in addition to, to the map and to the bar, it's important to also be able to show you one of the other uh, search filters that we have here. So imagine you wanted to see all alumni in that area that work for Microsoft. We'll hit search, and what this is gonna do now is it's gonna search for every entity in the database that's got Microsoft, Microsoft Corporation on it. See how quick it also brings that back up. And then what I can do is if I wanted to exclude Microsoft employees from this pool, I would hit this check minus here, or if I just want to include those individuals, I hit the plus, and now that 27, this is going to drop down. You can see now I've got the 27 that are there, and we could go through and uh, add accordingly. The thing that's really powerful about this search feature here is that when you exclude somebody based upon one attribute that's in them on the data, they're gone for good. So if you can imagine the power behind excluding people who have said, I don't want to receive a particular mailing list, or people that belong to a particular uh, wealth or capacity rating, by using this, you can make sure to exclude them 100% from the population. One of the other things about this 3.1 release that hasn't been out into the uh, the world until now are what we call our, our composite filters. And what a composite filter does, if you can imagine various components about one piece of information from the database. So for example, degrees have a lot of information that describes what that degree is, or gifts may have a lot of information that describes what the gift is. A composite filter allows for you to be able to go through and select multiple information about that one attribute. So we're gonna come down here to this payment section, which is all of the transactions into the system. So if you ever get a request, how many people gave to this college or to this area of the institution for a capital project, quickly you can go into this and you can find that immediately. So you can drop down, and this is an intelligent filtering process which would make sure that if you choose arts and sciences, you're not gonna get accounting as part of the division. You're gonna get everything that's associated with the College of Arts and Sciences. So it follows a hierarchy, referential integrity of the data going all the way through. And once you get this programmed right, the beauty of it is, is it's gonna be right all the time. So if we wanted to choose arts and sciences, and we wanted to see everyone that gave to capital property funds, and then we also wanted to take a look at what the amount of those gifts or those transactions were, either as individual transactions, or if we wanted to look at the sum of those transactions over a period of time, or if we also wanted to look at the date, we could do that. VJ, how many different uh, components can be in a composite? As many as you want. As many as you want. So with as many as you want, you can imagine them for some of the more complicated scenarios that you have on campus with degrees or gifts or things of that nature, you can go out and be completely extensible there. We've used composites in a variety of different ways. 
So imagine now with the same data model being able to go out and take a look at all of your beneficiary information. That is to say, give me a list of everybody that graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences that was awarded a scholarship between this period and this period. It's exceptionally fast to be able to do that. You don't burden your report writing people. And once the data has been vetted in terms of the logic to get it up in here, you're done. Dinah, I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell them about how they actually get their data translated from their database to becoming a filter. That's that simple. So everything that's behind this is basically SQL statements that are getting extracted from the database to shoot it up in there. So it's a common denominator skill set. Everyone here knows how to write a SQL statement. We wrap it up into a little bit of package, ships up to the system, and it's there. We've also, for those of you who may be interested from a prospect standpoint, we're able to, or this is, this is our membership. You're actually able to like query, you know, uh, alumni memberships or other membership organizations that you have on your campus. We also have a, uh, a prospect composite, which is pretty cool, which allows you to be able to go out there and pull a list of all prospects that are to a particular area, at a particular stage, at a particular rating, all being able to do this, self-sufficient within one application. Not multiple reports that you have to manage, one place. Generates a list, it's an Excel file, people can be off to the races on it. Any questions on this composite filter before I move on? So one of the things that people had asked us about to do, and part of the investment from these licensees that we've uh, been able to bring into our family, was asking us uh, to be able to save their results. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to take a moment, but I'm going to drop this population down to zero, and then we're going to go back through and we're going, to, we're going to select that faculty number. What this is doing and why I want to show you an operation that takes a little while is it's actually going out there and it's blacklisting every ID that's part of this key value pair relationship and says you are no longer eligible to be part of this population. And as you can imagine, when you're dealing in the millions of rows, to be able to run that statement is going to take a little bit of time. If you're sitting at your terminal and doing it in Oracle or SQL Server, I guarantee you it's going to take you longer than that, especially when you get into the millions. So we're going to get here and we're going to create this faculty list right here. And it's going to go out and it's going to add up those 14,558. Now this is kind of cool. If I wanted to see how many faculty have given gifts over the course of time, I can see that our faculty are very generous at the University of Washington. I just told you by clicking down that mouse there that 297,000 gifts over the course of time have been made by faculty. What I didn't tell you was is there's automatic payroll deduction that they've all done and it comes out every two weeks and they're about 50 cents a piece. But nonetheless, that number is kind of impressive. So 297,000 gift transactions that we could then go down to that, that composite filter and query out again. So say, for example, that that's the population that you wanted to be able to work with. We come up and we've got this checkout functionality now. So you have the ability to actually name your population. We'll call it faculty. And then the description is, we'll just call it test there, so that you have some metadata associated with this if you need to come back into the future. This is a summary page in terms of what it is that you've run. And it's also a time for the user to be able to check themselves to make sure that, hey, that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to include, not exclude faculty. Any other area of information that's part of it would be present up there. Then you can choose a population for which you want to be able to select on. If I wanted to pull all 297,000 GIFs for whatever reason, if I had a big data project that I wanted to run some analysis on it, done pull them down into Excel, go off to the races, throw them in Tableau or whatever else. But I'm going to go here to this entity population. I'm going to hit next. And then all the data in the world from that relational database is available for your users to be able to put together from that buffet of columns things that they need to be able to do solicitation list, mail merge, sit down and determine what they're going to do for an event. It's all readily available for you right there. Come down now to the bottom, you see all that information, you hit next. This is completely variable language by organization, so if you have an organizational data policy, a policy that you want to make sure that people follow, we can get that language up in there. We have two downloadable formats. People really are interested in using tablets these days, so we can export it to HTML, and it can sort kind of cool within HTML within the browser, for which you may not have Excel on it or another CSV operation. Or, of course, Excel. But uh, CSV, yes, I agree to those terms. 
finish. And in just a matter of moments here, there's that Excel file that we've created. All of our faculty, if they hopefully have Excel on this, now here it is. Boom. Right there. That passed. So no need to run any other report. No need to do anything besides fire it up and tell your users that it's available, some minimal training, and they're off. To date, when we look at all of our partners, we look at what we've done at the University of Washington between our first, second, and third versions of this, we're north of about 20,000 reports that have actually been run through this application. And we've had some growing pains along the way, but we've also had a, a community of users who have been committed to seeing this platform be successful and it helped us in terms of being able to design this, this really beautiful interface interaction model. And so I think the next thing to be able to show you once this thing resets its data up is an area of functionality that we uh, believe is going to be really powerful into the future. How many of you have publications on campus that contain data on alums, stories, so on and so forth? Everybody got some of that? So we went through a process, and we are in the process of going through another process to, to determine how we can do this really to scale. I'm a guy that loves process. You can't do this if you don't love process. But what I can tell you about this wonderful process that we've done, and these wonderful graphics are going to come up here in a moment, we went through our Collins Magazine. And if any of you are familiar with the University of Washington, that's our alumni donor magazine. That's one of our proud alums up there at the top, Jake Locker, who's currently the quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. But what we've done is we've gone through there, and we have parsed out of every single article, both automated and some manual work, every listing of an individual that has been written on in a magazine in Collins Magazine or written in an article in Collins Magazine. And so if you can imagine, as a gift officer, being able to come in here and type up the name of somebody that you wanted to see if there was anything written about them, and we're going to pick on this guy, Walt Dreyfus, immediately I can pull up and I can see we've written one article on Walt Dreyfus. So if I want to see what that article looks like on Mr. Dreyfus, I select him here, and you're going to see everything drop down to one. One publication count, one entity. Guy's generous. He's given 52 gifts to the UW. I go here to check out, and I'm going to just type in Dreyfus. I'll hit next. I'm going to go up here and select publications because I'm interested in reading this article. I hit next. I'm going to see the av available data here. Next. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download this in HTML so I can see if there's a hyperlink article there available for us. And there it is. If I do a control F, right there. So out of all those hundreds of thousands of magazines that we've looked at over the years, I'm able to show that one place where Walt Dreyfus is immediately. And if you have a repeatable process like what we're working on hopefully being able to roll out here, if you can imagine this for every department letter that's gone out, if you can look at it for every campus magazine that's gone out or campus magazine, the impact on something like this is pretty profound. We found, and kind of the genesis behind this was we tried to solve a problem. And the problem was is one of our gift officers went to lunch with somebody a couple years ago and was in the process of warming them up for a $5 million gift. And they were going to make the big ask over lunch and then have a follow-up, uh, hopefully, celebration tea uh, with the dean later on in that afternoon. Well, the gift officer was relatively new to the university. And uh, unfortunately, in the short period of time that they were there, didn't have the opportunity to get all their research, all their ducks in a row, to do the Google searches within all the internet documents. Uh, didn't have the time to actually go through and ask research to go through all of the different things that we knew to make up this wonderful profile who this individual was. Well, the person sits down and they go to lunch. I think it was at the Fairmont Hotel downtown Seattle at the time. Sits down at lunch. And the person was prepped because they knew where they had worked. The person had known a little bit about their family. They knew a little bit of history, but proceeded to ask them five questions that were directly answered in an article that we had published two months prior. And at the end of that, the donor stood up and said, I appreciate being here, but it's clear that you don't know me, or at least none of you know me really well, and walked out. Had we had some functionality like that, where that person had told us the story and it was available to them, that gift officer could have been that much more prepared. Fortunately, we were able to salvage the relationship and bring them back in, but it was an embarrassing situation that could have been avoided by taking advantage of data that was right under our nose. 
And there's so much of that. And so what we believe that we're trying to do is we're just scratching the surface of finding that information out there. And if we can organize it in such a way to be able to integrate it into a system like this, no longer are we looking at the blinders of what's just in the CRM. We're starting to see a much wider perspective in terms of who people are, the richness of their lives, and how it integrates into the work that it is that we do and many other organizations do as well. We're very excited about this feature. That visual guide that I showed you there is also used for some of our other folks. and we can reset this population. I'll show you just in a second. That, that the visuals uh, of the map, we also have used that to uh, show our sports teams. So if you wanted to go out there and choose all of the football players or all the tennis players, you're able to do that as well. And it's a neat way to represent and render the data. And if you have like keystone events that you want to highlight or things along those lines, you're able to do that using this really cool filter right here. So. And kind of before we'll open up to some questions, the, 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 uh, the natural one is, is, is how does the data get up into this from a security standpoint? What's going on? Those are, the, those are the common questions that we usually get next after people have seen this and think, wow, this thing looks pretty cool. The way that the data gets up into the system is that whether you're on Oracle or whether you're on SQL Server, we have a series of store procedures that Dinah and our team, Sean, everybody has, has written, that will go out there, that will extract the data, it's going to serialize it, it's going to encrypt it, and shoot it up to Microsoft Azure. Fairly simple process. Like Dinah had mentioned there, if you can write a SQL statement to render the data, you can get data up into our system. We have got a wonderful partnership with uh, Cassava Security, who comes in and routinely walks our code. We also run through a series of tests against our, 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 our application frequently. Sean has done an awesome job of ensuring to the extent that we can that this code and this application are safe because we realize the importance of keeping data security top of mind as it relates to having, in our case, millions of people's information, gift, degree, activity, online. And so we take that very seriously. So that data goes up. It sits depending on what part of the country you are. Uh, Sean determines where you're going to be geolocated. So if you're going to be on the west coast, you're usually in San Jose. If you're on the east coast, you're in Virginia. What do we do about people in the middle? So we'd love to have somebody from Chicago sign up or the Midwest. So talk to me afterwards. But that's what really happens is that data just goes up in there. The availability of our application, we've had two to three significant downtimes since we've, we, we've put this up. Uh, the first one was, and it kept Sean and I up all night, was I think GoDaddy misdirected traffic one time for our SSL. That was a problem. Uh, the second problem was VJ got a really bad cold one time and we couldn't get up and uh, we were down for about 20 minutes. And then the third time that we were down is, is when we were upgrading the systems. But otherwise, our partnership with Microsoft has allowed us to achieve two things, and that's scale and availability. And we don't need to burden our internal people uh, with trying to maintain a system as complex and as powerful as this one here. I, th I think, you know, as, as we start to think, and, and certainly Sean and I have been on this a long time, and on the rest of our team, Dinah and Vijay and everybody else, what's really important about this is the stories and the impact of making that data available to people. And when you think in terms of what the end product is of the organizations for which we serve, it's pretty profound. And sometimes those opportunities come up quite quickly. We're all busy. There's a lot of reports that stack up in our queue, and we can't get to all the information at any point in time. But you can't tell that to somebody who's looking to end cycles of poverty in their family over generation over generation that wants the promise of a degree in higher education, that a tool like this can get more data available to the right people to make that pitch out to. You can't make that a problem when you can't get access to the information when you've got a researcher who's got the cure for cancer sitting in their lab on their shelf, but they don't have people to tell that story to because access to that information is good enough. You can't use that as an excuse when you've got faculty members in these wonderful labs around the country that are on the tip of some technological innovation that's going to spur the economy forward. You can't wait on some of these things. And access, smart access to information that enables you to go out there and gather, get out the message of what it is that these wonderful organizations do. That's what this is really all about. And I'll close with one story before I open up to Q&A that really hits home to that. Does everyone remember Joplin, Missouri? 
when that horrible tornado came through, caused about a billion and a half dollars worth of damage, wreaked absolute havoc on people's lives. There was a, a wonderful person who worked at our nursing school at the time. Her name was Philippa Casova. And that happened on a Sunday. And Sunday night, she got into this application. She was so excited to know that she could get out to these people. She goes to this little map feature here. And she did a search. And she found every nursing grad that was within 100 miles of the impact of that storm in Joplin, Missouri. And by the time that cell service was restored, by the time they got their internet back, every single one of those people got a message from their school that the University of Washington was thinking of you, they were praying for you, and they were hoping that normalcy was going to be returned soon. We didn't have to wait for somebody to complete the report request. We didn't even have to write it. Access to that information, to that data, was readily available for our people to be able to use. And that's what I'd like to close with, because that's what this is about. It's about access to that information, making it available, and making those opportunities for our campuses, the wonderful things that we do, whether you're a college, a university, or other organization, access to that information is what this application is about. And uh, if you'll let me, I'll take your questions. Thank you. Yes. It's a great question. A lot of it depends on the policy and the personality of the institution that we deal with. Some places are completely open. Use it for whatever you want. And some are much more uh, expressed in the very specific use that you can use for that information. Since it is an Excel file, the uses of it are, are, are varied. A lot of people mail merge thank you letters off of the system. A lot of people will do events based off of that. It just, it just really depends. Sean and his team have busted tail. We have all the metadata associated with your usage so that you can actually see how often people are using the system. And then also be able, in terms of being able to follow up and saying, hey, you dropped a huge block of data out of the system. What are you guys doing with that? I should also mention one of the features that these guys put in on the extract part it would be a travesty to be able to download one, point, you know, 1 million people from the database. We can cap that to any number that you want. So if you want 10,000 to come out, if you want 50,000, 100,000, it's up to you. Sean, what's the biggest file we've generated out of here, though? Yeah, so, so it goes pretty wide. And how long did it take to create that Excel file? Yeah, so it's fast bringing that down there. And the uses are just very... Yeah. And for you that didn't hear that, Sean basically said, because we make the data so accessible to people and it's so available in real time, significant, it's, it's kind of like a pulley. The more available that we have it in our system, the less shadow databases that are out there around campus. Susan, how many entities are you guys going to load up with us at USC? Was it one, one and a half? One, almost yeah, almost one and a half. So we're, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, Penn State, we had a conversation with those guys. Is it Penn State here? Eric and the team? Yeah. What are you guys going to maybe do if we get you guys up? Two million? Yeah. We're starting to talk some significant numbers at that point. Great. Wendy, are you here? Did I see you? Will you stand up for just a second? Uh, everybody in this room that's interested in wonderful access data to geographic information from a map standpoint, Wendy and the team at Melissa Data. Is Philip in this room too, or is he not here? Just Yeah, so Wendy is the person you'd want to talk to in terms of being able to take the information from your system to geocode over uh, to make sure that we have proper lat longitude in, our, in, in the system to render there. Sean, how would you describe in terms of the accuracy down to what? Yeah. 
Yep. So we go through a process that Sean has written that goes through, takes all of our address data, massages it through Wendy's system, and then we come back with that delivery point barcode information, which is zip plus four plus two plus whatever. Uh, you're ahead of the curve. And so what we're trying to do here is, is act like a wedge, which is starting with the data that we know really well, but then presenting it in such a way that there is really power in being able to leverage all of these other sources. We have some additional data models that I didn't get into today that show the ability to cross-query all of that data with U.S. Census information. We can also cross-query it with IRS return data in terms of being able to identify people that live in the most charitable areas. We cross-reference it with uh, the Forbes 100 richest zips, which is great. Uh, and then we also uh, have cross-referenced this. If you have anybody in your organization from a planned giving standpoint, we pulled in the Forbes 100 top places to retire to, well, it was Milken Foundation, top 100 places to retire to, and being able to cross-query that with somebody's age. And if they're not including the institution in, in, their, in their plans, that, that may uh, beckon a conversation. So we do cross-query some sources. I believe uh, around the corner is where the New York Times would format articles a little bit differently in such a way so that we could cross-query and we could leverage that information. That's a great question. International data? It varies so much by jurisdiction. So we had our first inbound uh, request for an international deployment of this, and so we're in the process now of evaluating because the law laws are so different each way. When it comes to actually incorporating international like address data into it, right back there, Wendy again, we're going to look to Melissa to be kind of the leader in terms of helping us with that. As far as international organizations and entities wanting to get their data up into it, we're still kind of going through that because we've just been presented with that opportunity. So can you describe the suite of licensing that occurred in your product? Are you, as Melissa and OEM, do you handle all the licensing aspects? So we've been in, in conversations with Melissa to try to integrate a much more fluid relationship if your data doesn't come native with all of those delivery point barcode mechanisms in it. So hopefully over the course of the next few weeks, maybe months, we'll be able to announce a more formal partnership with Wendy and their team. Um, the licensing standalone for this application is something that's a process that we go through for uh, University of Washington Center for Commercialization. And so what those guys will do is we'll, we'll start a conversation with the organization. We'll find out how many entities are in the database, how many people that you want to have access to the system, as well as as many multiple different data sets that you want to be able to query against. And then we come up with a license price that is generally mapped across to what our cost would be to host that data up into the Microsoft Azure cloud. We can do that for you in working in concert, and that's usually a process that either Sean or Dinah or I are involved with where we'll sit down. Uh, we have a, a series, Clint just got done with this exercise. We have a series of templates that we fill out that say, who are the end users? What are the reporting scenarios that they want to be able to use this application for? Where are the data assets located in the, in, the, in the schematic? And then from there, it gives us kind of a blueprint to go forward. And that was actually uh, something that we've uh, used across the board, and it's been very helpful for us in starting those conversations. Yeah? Constituents often give you rules for how they want to be communicated. Yep. Like never email, only email. Yep. So the question was, people, constituents, if you've got a million people in the database, likely there's a good percentage of those folks who have said, don't ever contact me. How would you handle something like that? Is that, that fair? Or only contact me through this one channel. Only contact me through that one channel. 
Uh, so one way that we handle it is we can roll it up here and display it so the end user has to handle that on their own and exclude those individuals because they meet one of the following sets of criteria. Never talk to me again or if it's a situation where you want to only force include to a particular mailing list, you can use that mailing list codes control over there and only grab those people. And then conversely, if there's an exclude code that says, you know, I don't want to receive anything from arts and sciences, you could, you could bump them out as well. The other way that we can handle this that makes it more uh, end user proof is that we can restrict that data going up. And so we can sophisticate in the SQL statements, hey, don't include this going up into the cloud. That brings up a good point. <clears throat> this is what it's like to be able to go out and search all of the different reports for which you've actually generated in the system. And if you want, I have did this population here of Microsoft employees and faculty. If I wanted to see who was in common on those, I could combine them and be able to deduplicate the results and we could see who's in, in both of those groups. I can also subtract the results from one to another. Carolyn, did you have a question? No, okay. Yeah. So, um, how often are you uploading data and refreshing the button and starting the investigation? So, we update it once a day. It depends on the size of the footprint that's going up in there. What'd this take? 25 minutes to go up? It's 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes to go up. So, not that long considering that just scale of all that data that's actually in the system going up. But yeah, once a day. Uh, Sean, what version? Nine nine, something like that, I think. One thing that's kind of one thing that's kind of interesting when you uh, think about that data on the left hand side, a lot of it's base tables, and then a lot of it's denormalized tables in terms of incorporating all of our business logic, which makes VJ's job a lot easier when we can. Uh, build those composite filters is a lot of that business logic's already built into it. Clint's finding that, what they're doing at Oregon as well. If I wanted to refine it by address? Oh, like householding type of things that way? Yeah, we're uh, currently, that's one thing that we, we realize is an opportunity, for lack of a better term, uh, to really do householding a lot better. So we're exploring a handful of different options where we will, and, and, the, and, and part of the, the tricky part is, is we've got to be good for all systems. And so a lot of the CRMs store that information a little bit differently. So we're brainstorming the best way to handle that right now. You could theoretically introduce a model where all of it would be distilled down into the household and be able to query off of that. Or uh, more painstakingly, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense to scale. You could include both the ID and the, the family ID number and go through and do some of that math yourself. I wouldn't recommend that, but we're looking at ways to make that much more intelligent into the future. Yeah, that's right. Keep the kids out of the knives. Here in the administrative portal, you're actually able to go in there, and we're going to come down here to the uh, advancement data set here. And Sean, where is that at? I'm under un edit data set details. Sorry. Yeah, right there. So the maximum download rolls for this data set are set at 100,000. We haven't actually mapped that out to individual users yet. We've tried to do it at a, at a per data level. Great question, though. So here's the, the uh, assigned roles to be able to download the particular columns of that data and information. And if you wanted to change it, you just click on that comma, add the new one. You'll notice that one thing that's kind of cool is that we really, in terms of any of the data 
uh, that's entered or used without the system. There's no text boxes for the data. There's just lines throughout. So we hope that gives it a really clean, sleek design. Yeah? Random. Not yet. That's a good idea, though. Yeah? So what about the things that are for a particular user? Are they run to a network um, for it more of a message that can be given? We haven't notified them on that. That was something that we should probably put in there. I, I, I didn't think of that. That's a good, that's a good call. We should probably, we could put that in the checkout process that only the X first number. What? On, yeah, the message though to the end user, hey, by the way, we're truncating this by three. Well, we're on it. What else? Nothing? How are we doing on time? Oh, it's noon. Golly, I'm sorry. Boy, we tried to get you out of here early. Lunch, you're going to walk out that door in the back. You're going to hang a right. You're going to go down the staircase. Regency ballroom. Have a good lunch. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.